Right, so where was I? Sorry about that. Different car. No CCTV, different steering wheel. I'm on my way to a postgraduate meeting. I know, me, going to a postgraduate meeting. Uh, uh, uh. Actually, it's like, it's a BDA postgraduate meeting, so I'll be mostly social. Uh, no, I'm talking, we're talking about competition between the state and the private sectors. And uh, I just remembered that I'd been along to an open day. Kent Police do an open day every year. And it was in Maidstone. And it's in a big field and they have police dog demonstrations and uh, uh, how to crack people's skulls with bayonet demonstrations and uh, there's a police helicopter there and they've got guns guns on the gun range oh that's right don't help me out by indicating left will you oh no and uh, anyway uh, one of the good things about it is you get to chat some quiet senior officers so I spoke to a chap who's uh, in uh, major crime. He's a uh, DCI in major crime, I think. And uh, because I like to support the little, the little people, you know that there's loads of people around there all talking about just general stuff. But then the, the, the less frequented booths were the uh, serious economic crime and major crime booths and computer was it. So because I like computers and stuff like that. I thought I'd go and have a chat with them, and they're, um, they, you know, they're like they're very friendly, and it's there one day to sort of talk to the public and open up a bit about their work, you know, which is obviously a big mistake, huge. But uh, uh, and you can have a chat with them until they sort of suss that you're not a not a complete numpty. Like for example, I'm uh, I'm at the um, the computer computer. Uh, analysis uh, thing and uh, he sees me coming up and of course he sees he sees some old twit who is probably worried about uh, cyber crime and giving his password away online or getting fished or uh, uh, you know giving money to women abroad uh, you know emotional what do they call it fiance type crime so when I come up to him and said hi hi you know, how you doing he's like oh hello sir would you like a, a brochure on how to avoid uh, on the latest types of cyber crime? So I'm like, yeah, 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 that would be great. Oh, hello, we've had a police, we've had a ambulance, and now we've got two squad cars. Oh, they, no, they're both ambulances. So there's been some massive smash up there. Probably that in Twitter, that wasn't indicating left. So he's like, you know, is there anything you'd like to know? He said, we've got this brilliant website. It's called Have I Been Pwned? P-W-N-E-D. He said, and you can put your email in and it'll tell you if you've been the subject of a data breach. He said, would, would you like to have a go? So I thought, okay, right, I'll, I'll sort of humour him, you know. So I put my email address and it comes up that I've been, my, my, uh, web, my email address has been released five times through data breaches one was on the bitcoin.com website data breach and then there was another one um, the hard wallet uh, breach bitcoin hard wallet not trezor the other one ledger ledger so it comes up as been released on the ledger.com data breach and so he's immediately he's like hello you know <laughs> I'm asking this bloke if he likes to like to have his dog chipped, and it turns out he's Jack the Ripper. So uh, I said, to him, "Oh, you know, your your blockchain analysis." I said, "Who do you get to do that?" And he looked at me and he said, "Well, he says I suppose it's not, it's not, you know, it's in the public domain." He says, "We use chain analysis," and I said, "Ah, oh, right, the oldest one, the oldest one, and the biggest one, you know, the best one, sort of thing." The original and he's like okay this bloke's a ringer so he wouldn't talk to me after that so he moved on to some he searched for another old dear who's uh, had a lost her savings through a password breach because her passwords monkey one two three 
and then uh, so I sidled over to Major Crime and I said you know how's it going and they've got all these pictures of all this stuff all this bling all these trainers and Rolexes and stuff and he says what do you think about that he said that stuff we've seized this off of criminals and uh, you know now we sell it and he said that the proceeds go half to the uh, police and half to the state you know so so he said it's a fantastic initiative and I said yeah it does uh, encourage the police to seize stuff though doesn't it if they get to keep half of everything they seize then I don't know call me old-fashioned but at least there's a perception of a conflict of interest there isn't there so he's like uh, so he said yeah because I mean he said yeah because he's thinking that's a good thing though isn't it you know not he didn't see the conflict at all well the conflict is not so much in the UK I think because in the UK you have to be convicted of a crime and then you have to prove that you all this stuff you own you earned honestly and if you can't prove you earn it honestly then it gets confiscated in America they've taken it a step further you don't have to be convicted of a crime they can just stop you and see what you've got on you you know do a shakedown and uh, if they've got anything on you you've got anything on you of any value like for example say you say you're going to buy a car and you're going to and the blokes ask that you pay for it in cash so say you've got thirty thousand dollars in cash on you then uh, what they'll do is they'll they'll just confiscate the thirty thousand dollars and it's then up to you to prove that it's your money and you own it. Well, <clears throat> that is the problem with that approach, the American approach, is that they have got a big interest in seizing anything. They literally go around grabbing stuff, like some effing pirates. Anybody who's on the road is, uh, you know, can be stopped for anything, uh, headlight problem or whatever, whatever and then they have a good old search through the car and, and nick anything that's in there and then you then you then have to hire an attorney and take legal action almost certainly in a state that you might have been just driving through you know yeah goodbye goodbye you know you, you might live in Texas and you might have been driving through Arizona and you have to hire an Arizona attorney to try and get your money back and uh, let's assume that it is your money and you can prove that it's still you're still going to take you six months to get it back and you've still got to pay the attorney fees so that's the end of the slippery slope you know saying oh it's great isn't it you know we can sell this bloke's trains also i mean i've got to say for some reason if you're involved in serious crime all all taste goes out the window you're not you're like I don't know. I wouldn't be seen dead in any of the stuff that they were selling. I wouldn't buy their, their sort of blingy watches and stuff like that if if they were giving them away. But you know, apparently that's what you. That's the whole point of showing how wealthy you are. Is you buy stuff which is so crap that nobody in their right mind would have ever spent any money on it unless they got so much money that they. It's either buy this watch or, or stick it on the fire, you know, and cook your baked beans. So, anyway, he was complaining to me that they've got a problem because I, again, I was like, so I, I was, <laughs> Bitcoin's used for a lot of crime, isn't it? I've heard that Bitcoin, that what's it called, Bitcoin? That's used for a lot of crime. And he's like, well, well. And he said, I'll give you an idea. He said, we've got 30,000 police on the force and only six of them are really dealing with Bitcoin. He said, that's, that's, but the problem is, he said, as soon as we get someone trained up, they, um, they move into the private sector and get a decent job on good pay. So he said, there's some talk about in return for us training them up, then they should have to work for us for five years. And I thought, hello, your, your bloke is talking to the same bloke who's talking to the dental people who's saying the dentists who get trained at public expense should work on the NHS uh, for five years and, uh, and and the answer is that while it you know it's nice to have that sort of uh, autocratic dictatorial powers over people you know to put them into bonded slavery you can't really do it 
um, for several reasons. First is that uh, people are people pay taxes and they their taxes pay for the universities, and so there's no reason why they should have to pay for the universities again if their taxes have already paid or will already pay for the universities. And uh, believe me, dentists pay a lot in tax. So a dentist can more than justify the cost of his training from the tax he's going to uh, contribute to society during his lifetime. And the other thing is that um, you can't really make it work. I, I have got, in dentistry, we've got the problem at both ends. Let me just explain to you. There are no NHS dentists. Why are there no NHS dentists? Not because there are no dentists. It's because there are no dentists willing to work for the NHS fees. If they um, had NHS, if they paid the NHS dentists what private dentists earn in the private sector, there would be no shortage of NHS dentists. So their shortage of NHS dentists can be traced entirely to the fact that they're paying, go on, you can go, less than the market rate for the job, okay? When I was qualified in 1981, they were paying the market rate for the job, which was somewhere in the top 10th, the 10th decile. And now they're not paying the market rate for the job, so they've got nobody doing the job. Okay, it's as simple as that. And this is the problem that the policeman's got. He's not paying the market rate for blockchain skilled uh, analysts, and so, so he hasn't got any, right? At the other end, I have got, I've just had a receptionist leave me to join Border Force because they can pay a £30,000 a year and I can't pay a much more than the lower, the lower end of the 20s. So there, I have got no receptionist because, and Border Force have, because in, that, in this particular area, if you want a decent wedge, you can go and work in the, in the uh, public sector for Border Force and they'll, uh, you know, I mean, you know, it's, honestly, it's crappy work, it's shift work, it's tiring, there's, there's a possibility of vir violence, there's a possibility you're going to catch some, some bloody disease that hasn't existed in this country for 200 years. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of money for someone who's got no house and wants to start saving up for a house and stuff like that. So, the, so we've got no NHS dentists because the, uh, the public sector is underpaying relative to the private sector and I've got no nurses because they're, they're overpaying for unskilled workers. And all right, yeah, okay, Pam Swain, you know, wind your neck in. That's what they are, dental nurses for the most part, always were unskilled workers. Um, and uh, and so of course we can't compete. So my advice to him, and he didn't really want my advice, or I'll need my advice, or ask for my advice, would be you have to pay the market rate for the job. If you want a thousand blockchain analysts, you have to pay a thousand times what a blockchain analyst can get in the free market. But of course they don't like that, do they? They don't like that. Often. They like to think that, uh, that there's some, they've got an, they, you know, people have an obligation to work in the private sector. After all, they're working in the private sector. It's good enough for them. Why isn't it good enough for everybody else, you know? And the NHS, to a certain extent, does, for, uh, you know, boast that there are benefits over and above just the actual physical number that, of pounds that people are paying. So, for example, um, you know, if, if uh, Whitney Houston comes to London and uh, tries to play the O2 and she doesn't sell out all the seats, then the word goes out around the hospitals that anybody who's, you know, free that evening can, can get a Whitney Houston ticket free, free of charge. Or uh, Elton John, you know, is, is playing the cricket ground in Canterbury. And so the word goes round that he's made a certain number of, seats available for local hospitals and um, public sector work, council workers I suppose and anyone who's in the public sector um, and I would imagine he, he writes it off he puts it down as a charitable donation I would imagine and uh, therefore he gets the uh, gets it as a tax write-off I don't know that I'm just I'm not I don't know anything about tax or at that level anyway so I'm just guessing but I mean, that definitely happens. Those two things 
did definitely happen in terms of the, the availability of tickets. So, it's no use. It used to be the pension. They used to say, oh, you ought to join the NHS uh, and because you get a bloody good pension on the NHS. Uh, but in fact, you don't. I mean, I'm in receipt of my NHS pension and I had a pension pot of £800,000 and I'm getting about £1,500 a month, which is sod all. Do you know what I mean? It's not for £800,000 pension pot saved up and I'm, I'm earning less than the minimum wage, less, less than the average wage anyway. So the, the pension is not an argument like it used to be, and it's certainly not an argument like it used to be in the police, because the police used to have a very good uh, final salary pension. A lot of people had final salary pensions, and then of course they took them off uh, final salary and put them all on defined contribution, which means that you know you don't get to earn a certain amount of money when you um, when you retire, the amount of money you get paid depends on how much money you've paid in. And if the people you've paid it to mismanaged it, fucked it all up and earned nothing, uh, you know, pissed it all up against the wall by being, you know, by buying government bonds and stuff, then uh, then that's it, mate. You're just, you know, you you've got to get on the phone to B and Q and get yourself a, a job stacking shelves. So, that is a bit of a tour de force, isn't it, of all the issues involved in areas where the public sector and the private sector bump into each other, come up against each other. Uh, and I think it's a, a very, it's a fascinating and important subject. Because we are getting towards this point where we are... Uh, getting more collectivist and everyone's deciding that the world would be a good idea if only they were in charge and, and they say where every everybody spent their money and you know and, and they were in charge of the government this sort of absolute dictatorship that everybody wants and also there's a there's a bunch of people who just expect the state to provide everything for them they want the state to provide uh, their house their food their health care their education uh, through the BBC, their entertainment. There's there's no end to what uh, people want the the NHS to provide. Not the NHS, the state, the state. So where you've got areas where there's still what I call the resistance, you know, where you've got dentists, like, as I have, been providing dentistry as an in, as an alternative to the state provision. And doing it quite successfully as well, you know. I mean, literally thriving in an in an in a an environment which is hostile to us, where everyone's being told you, you're stupid to go private because you can get all this on the NHS and it, it costs you nothing or next to nothing. Um, and they've got the same problem in the education, haven't they? They've got a bunch of people saying, "Why are you going private?" Um, because you can get a state education for nothing or next to nothing. So, and the answer is, you know, the people have the right to choose. They have the right to do it if they want to. And, and again, I'll just come back finally to the point that everybody who goes private, or everybody who, takes, who puts their children through a private school, is freeing up resources for everybody else's children. So your children, if they go to state school, benefit from... Uh, my children didn't go to private school, but I mean, they, they, every child that goes to private school is doing you a big favour. And if you can't see that, then really, you, you know, what you're not really looking. I don't think we want a, um, a society where the state provision is the only option. You know, where it's the only, it's the only viable way of providing any sort of service. Uh, we don't want. I mean, that's the old Soviet socialist Soviet republic, isn't it? Where everybody drives a, a larder or a Trabant and lives in the crumbling uh, tower block with concrete cancer, and the rubbish is never picked up, and we're, we're, you know that's the recipe for a grey world. 
we have to try and keep the private sector alive. And uh, if the NHS uh, and all the all the public sectors are exempt from most taxes, then I think that those people who provide a similar service in the private sector should be exempt too. Anyway, that's a long one, and uh, sorry you didn't get to see this journey because you've never seen this one. I've come to Margate. Someone's got their volume up. They had a concert here in Dreamland a couple of days ago. One girl died of a drug overdose. Seven people ended up in ICU. They cut a hole in the fence and, and tried to get into the site from over a railway. So they had to stop all the trains for hours. That's, uh, that's Margate. That's Margate on a good day. Anyway, take it. Take from what I've said what you like. I'll um, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye.